I want to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Susie Merriam. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Watsonville. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we do have our general plan team here. This is including um, staff from the City of Watsonville. Uh, Justin Meek, our Assistant Director, is going to take you through the presentation tonight, but we also have folks from um, Sergeant Town Planning and um, Circle Points um as well and i'm probably um missing some of you but they will introduce themselves as well later just uh as an introduction just thank you for joining us tonight and we are really excited to share the work that we've done thus far on the general plan updates uh this last spring and summer we kicked off an outreach campaign to get ideas about the future of watsonville what people like what people don't like what people want to see in the future. And based on all of this information, as well as information that was in the past 2030 draft general plan effort, we developed several different growth scenarios. So when Watsonville was incorporated way back in 1868, it was this small farming and ranching town with about 2,000 inhabitants, and it encompassed just a few streets in what's now our historic downtown. We know now Watsonville grew to become this industrial engine, processing, storing, and shipping agricultural goods grown just outside our borders um, to people throughout the world. We have also historically housed all of the people that work in the agricultural industry since the city's inception. Well, here we are, it's 2023, City's been um, in existence for over 150 years, and while Watsonville will always continue to support the agricultural industry, we have an opportunity now with a general plan update to dream bigger and imagine what Watsonville could look like in the next 30 years and for our future generations. So what do we want our town to look like? Do we need to expand beyond our boundaries to achieve what we want? The scenarios that will be presented tonight provoke questions about what the city's priorities are for our future. Does the city want to provide or prioritize economic development and a mix of housing types for our residents? Or do we prioritize historic uses such as the airport and the agricultural land that surrounds us? What do you, the residents, workers, and business owners in Watsonville want for yourselves and for your families? There's no right or wrong answer to these questions. There are just different points of view, different priorities um, and different choices. But as we, we as a community will be considering these options and choosing an alternative to study further um, next spring. So I hope that you enjoy tonight's presentation. We hope that you'll engage in a discussion towards the end of the meeting to help our, inform our next steps. And we will continue to provide outreach in the form of pop-ups at the farmer's market and various uh, other places in the community throughout the winter. And we also will be distributing another survey in early 2024 to get additional feedback on the scenarios you'll see tonight. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Justin to- uh, Can we have Alvaro do a Spanish um, announcement oh, as well? Yeah. All right, Alvaro, yes. You want to jump in and for those who need Spanish translation, we do have that. Uh, you're on mute, Alvaro. <laughs> yes. Can you just in Spanish let, let folks? Bienvenidos todos a la. 2050 Plan General de la Ciudad de Watsonville. Estamos haciendo esto para mirar cómo se va a mirar el futuro de Watsonville y estamos tan intentando de recibir los impuestos de toda la comunidad. Um, queremos uh, escuchar todos sus respuestas o opiniones y lo que piensan en el futuro. Y eh, Ahorita va a empezar la presentación, Justin, y muchas gracias. Can you tell if you could just let them know to press the interpretation, the Spanish, if they want the Spanish interpretation. Y luego, si quieren um, 
en español pueden oprimir el, el botón de español para escuchar en español. Thank you. Gracias. All right, Esther, you want to take it away? Sure, certainly. Thank you. Um, that was a great introduction and highlight to what we're going to be going through tonight. Uh, tonight agenda is fairly packed, so I'm going to be trying to cover a lot of territory, but also provide time and space to hear from all the participants here tonight. Um, just as a way as a quick overview, I'm going to touch on the general plan uh, process, what a general plan is, the overall project ske schedule, highlight some of the community engagement activities I've done to date, and how that has informed some of the guiding principles that will uh, guide this planning effort in updating the general plan. Then we're gonna to shift to discussion on different kinds of place types. Uh, we're placing a different focus on the general plan from land uses to more character-driven place types and how the community might evolve and change, which will inform different land use co concepts and ultimately growth scenarios that are to be presented for everyone's input and consideration. Um, those include you know, everything from place types that are more residential oriented to more predominantly commercial and growth scenarios that look at growing in and up and perhaps out in some of our growth areas that have been explored in the past and even include some more controversial topics of whether or not uh, closure of the airport is something that Guatemala want, wants to pursue and just as a way to give you a little precursor, looking at uh, possible closure of another airport, but cross in one way. And then we'll have a nice breakout session in which to gauge uh, your thoughts on all these topics uh, with an opportunity to report back out to the wider group. So that's an overview of tonight's agenda. And let's continue to move forward. Great, um, so just a couple of-, of Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, just a couple of quick notes. We're gonna do some, um, online kind of surveying of folks in the room. Um, so as we noted, the folk, things on the, the right side, the left side there, we've got Spanish translation available. Um, we've got the chat available for you to use throughout the meeting. You can put in questions, you can put in comments. If you're having trouble with our tool that we're using tonight, you can also put responses there. So that is for you to use. Um, we do ask that everyone of course is respectful of one another and um, and of the team that is, that's here to, as well. So just thinking about that with the chat as well. Um, if you do have a question, we are going to try to do more of the interactive um, voices at the end of the meeting when we do some breakout sessions, um, but definitely put your questions and comments into the chat um, that is at the bottom of the, the screen there. And we will now jump over to, I think, um, our interactive portion of the, the meeting. And so we're going to use this throughout the meeting from time to time. So Justin's going to present a lot of great great information, and then we're gonna take a pause and ask a couple of questions and allow you to do that. And so the easiest way to do this is to pick a, take your smartphone if you have it with you. That way you can keep your the presentation going on your screen, your, your laptop or your computer screen, and use the phone to do some of these survey questions. So you can either go on your phone to menti.menti.com and put in that code, or you can just hover over that QR code if you're familiar with those, and that'll take you directly to the survey tool that is called Mentimeter. So we'll give everyone a chance to do that. Hopefully you've got that. And we'll do one tester question. We'll see how many of us, how many people we have on using the tool here. So first question we're gonna ask, or let them people, I see people joining on there. And this is just the ability to type in your answer. So you should see a question pop up on your screen um, in the menti.com site that asking you what your favorite fruit is. And so you'll start to see the responses pop up on the screen. And if you didn't get a chance to do that QR code, there is the menti.com and the number will always be at the top of the screen when we're asking questions. And so we'll come back to this tool periodically. We've got a few more questions we're gonna ask before I turn it back over to Justin to do the lion's share of the presentation. So it looks like we've got some mango lovers in the crowd. Avocados, raspberry, guava, peach. Hopefully everyone's getting the hang of the tool. Sometimes it'll be, a, you type in a word, sometimes it'll be responding to a question. So we'll... hopefully we get a few more takers there. Um, maybe go, yeah, just go ahead to the next one, Monica. So the next question we wanna ask is what part of the city do you live in? 
And you'll see the seven different council districts there on the screen, along with a map that kind of helps you orient in case you forgot or you're not sure. And if you're still not sure, you have an option there as well. There's an option for if you do not live in Watsonville, but you maybe own property or work in the city, or you don't live here and you have another interest in the city. And so we'll go to the, the next slide that I'll recap those as well, but this is the interactive portion. So what you see on your, your phone will be a little bit different than what you see on the screen here, but this will start populating answers there. So there we go. We've got most of got somebody from all the all of the districts, which is great, good representation. We're hoping that some more folks, folks join on throughout the evening as well. We've got a few folks that work and or own some property, and then a couple that are here just representing different interests, which is great to have some other community members outside of the city here as well. All right, little snapshot there. And you know, these are just for us to give a, a, again, it's just a quick snapshot. We're not using this for anything, but to, to give us some information about who's in the room, so to speak, the virtual room here. So the next question is asking about your age. So not to be too invasive, but we like to know if we're getting a, a good cross-section of the community um, from an age perspective as well. So we'll go to that next slide with the actual question. So under 18, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45, 54, 55, 64, and 65 plus. So pretty good spread right now. It might be missing a little of the youth perspective, but that's, um, can we post the QR code again? Yes, we will try to do that. Once we get through this question, Monica, I'm not sure if we can go back to that without it generating it again. Okay. And you can also just enter menti.com, but you, there's certainly the QR code takes you right there. So here's that QR code again for those that may not have got it the first time. And then we have just a couple more questions just to ask for who's in the room, and then I'll turn it over to Justin. So we'll go ahead to that next one, Monica, which I think was, have you participated in the Watsonville general plan process so far? So there was a um, survey that Susie mentioned. There have been several different focus group meetings. We've had a general plan workshop prior to this one. You may have dropped by a pop-up event where you've seen some of the, the project, the, the planning team or the, the staff. Um, so we've got an, at least one newcomer so far, a couple of newcomers, which is great. And a few that have been here um, for a while or have participated in several different events. So welcome back. And sometimes it is hard to know because you may be involved in so many things in the city. Probably the general plan was one of them, but you, it may be hard to tell what you've been answering questions about. So that's great too. So lots of lots of folks that have participated several times, which is great, and a few newcomers as well. So wonderful. All right, and then just one last question here. How did you hear about the workshop tonight? And this is always helpful. Um, in terms of getting the word out and letting people know around the next time, what are some of the better ways to get, get the word out? And so you see some different choices, social media, received an email, farmer's market or another pop-up directly from a friend or colleague. You may be a CAC member and special recognition to a couple of those. I know we have at least one or two CAC, member, CAC members on the, the call, the Community Advisory Committee. Um, they've been really, really, really helpful throughout this process as well. So somebody from the farmer's market, a couple, as I mentioned, a couple of CAC members. Whoop. We moved a little too quickly there. There we go. <laughs> We're toggling back and forth between the PowerPoint and these interactive questions. So, so the emails seem to be working pretty well. So that's a great, great news for the, the team to be able to really double down and focus on those. And then directly word of mouth from somebody you know, which always is a great way to encourage people to participate. So, all right. So thanks for responding to those. We will do some more questions at different points throughout the presentation, but at this point, I'll turn it back over to Justin. Thank you, Susan. So some of you, this will be uh, a recap. For others, this might be new information. So we first just want to or you with the general plan. So let me give you a, a brief overview of what the general plan entails and we're on the schedule. So for, I know there's some that have been part of this process for in some cases, decades. 
Um, and for others, if this is your first time, let me just let you know that a general plan is a comprehensive document for charting the future growth of a community. It's typically long range, so you're usually looking 20 to 30 years into the future. It's something that's required by state law, but there's no necessary timetable. It's a living document that uh, is updated uh, as needed, and usually when there's uh, views for changes for a community. It establishes the goals, policies, and how those things will be implemented in shaping a community. Let's go on the next slide. Uh, um, one thing I just want to highlight is, you know, we, the city has a current general plan. It's the 2005 general plan. Uh, for those that have been part of the process in the past, they may say, wait a second, isn't there a 2030 plan that um, was adopted a while back? It was, and of course it was a subject of a legal challenge and is not in effect. So we were working under an old document uh, that uh, we would like to see to move forward and better consider what kinds of land uses and what kinds of things that we, the community uh, might want and need moving forward. Um, as with any general plan, there are certain elements or chapters that are included in all general plans and they range in topics such as land use to transportation, safety and open space and so forth, um, go ahead and click. And there's other topics that are really important too that have occurred uh, that are both required because of changes to state law, but are also just good practice to include with in one's general plan. And those uh, include everything from new topics such as environmental justice, which is a law that occurred about uh, seven years ago that focuses on whether a community that's disadvantaged has an uh, over concentration of uh, pollution in their community and how they might want to address it. The city is also engaged in various efforts to address climate and how to adapt to the changing climate and the risks that are associated with it. Uh, th and there's also considerations to part uh, historic resources such as in our downtown and elsewhere that can be included as part of this plan too. So you're looking holistically at a community, the built environment, as well as how uh, development may affect both affect these things and we want to help shape it. Let's move on. So we've started this project earlier in the year. Uh, the first phase was doing some engagement, getting a, a sense of people's overall sense of what uh, were the key principles that, the, uh, that we want to focus on, some key concepts of what should be included. And based off of that, have developed guiding principles as well as some preliminary uh, ideas for what kind of place wants to can become and where, and the associated growth scenarios. Uh, in the coming months and into next year, those would be further refined uh, so that we'd have a preferred alternative that can then form the preference of doing the environmental review that's required of this effort. So that's later of next year when we prepare what's called an environmental impact report. And along the way, there's maybe multiple opportunities for engagement and input as part of this process. You'll see towards the end of next year and into the following year is when the more pu formal public review period and hearings will likely occur. Uh, this and the ne next slide will just highlights the range of activities that we've done so far in reaching out uh, to hear from members of Watsonville and the surrounding area. As noted before, we've been at the farmer's market and other locations, held uh, an initial community workshop, uh, as well as a series of um, meetings with our advisory committee, um, both with the community and um, other technical folks from within the, uh, within the city and other agencies to get their input on this effort. We have a, um, a website that I strongly encourage people to visit. It's a wealth of information and it's another way to stay connected. A simple way just to highlight uh, the many ways in which we've been attempting to hear from people. Uh, this is summarizing the different ways in which we've reached out through August. We've done more since that time, but just noting the ways, the various email blasts to council meetings, uh, online responses to an initial survey, different pop-up events and so forth. And we'll continue this effort moving forward. Along the way, we've heard a range of things. I just wanna highlight a few of them here. Everything from uh, people's perception of Watsonville as a small town and how they would like to protect it, wanting to see a greater focus on equity, 
and uh, how um, this effort can foster more inclusiveness while still protecting not only small town character, but also natural open spaces. Housing has been a reoccurring theme that's uh, very important to provide for a range of housing for all income groups uh, and people with special needs. And along the way, other things that come up as well, including not only our open spaces, but things like art and culture, providing more outdoor recreational activities. These are the range of topics that we'll be including as part of this effort. So those, in looking at both the past general plans that we have to date, um, and looking and hearing from uh, community members so far, we've organized uh, 12 themes that we'll, are formulating what we're calling our guiding principles. So everything from a small town character to fostering a vibrant downtown. Many of these things are not mutually exclusive, but overlap. So you can imagine having a vibrant downtown helps foster a small town character at the same time, providing a range of housing options while enhancing the public realm along our streets. And so I just wanna highlight how these things can uh, work together in certain ways, but also wanna give an opportunity to um, gauge your thoughts on it. And Susan, I, I think you have a few things you'd like to add to that too. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. So these are these are really important. So these are, you know, just to mention, these are the guiding principles for the general plan. So these are the themes that are gonna be, we want to carry through all of those chapters and elements that Justin talked about and really make sure that they're being addressed in many different ways. And so we think that they're all important, but we did want to ask a question about which ones resonate most with you. So on the next screen, you have you know, the question will come up and ask you to choose three. So of these different guiding principles or these themes, which ones resonate, which ones are most important or rise to the level of importance for you today? And it could change from day to day, week to week, um, but just wanting to get a sense from you which ones really speak to you. And we didn't dig into a lot of details on each of them. We can make sure you know, they can draw some conclusions about each one. Um, so we're thinking about you know, whether it's the streetscape, whether it's um, thinking about mobility options, small town character. Justin mentioned housing is something we've heard a lot about. Um, downtown being important. So we'll give you a sense of or an opportunity to respond to a few of these and see which ones. And you can pick two, you can pick three, you can do as many as that speak to you. Um, we're not trying to take away any of them, but we certainly want to hear what's really important to, to you as community members and stakeholders. And then we are going to ask another question right after this of something that maybe you were surprised is not there. Um, and maybe we need to make sure it's either included as part of one of those guiding principles or potentially a new guiding principle. So these are draft form. These are really meant for you to react to. We've been bringing them out to pop-ups as well. Um, and somebody is saying it only lets you check one box. Um, if that's the case, then we're going to go with just one. And this will be like really your gut reaction. And I think you can change it as well. So, um, so as I noted, we're not trying to change any of these. We're not taking them away. But we just wanted to get a sense of what is really resonating with people. So if it is only letting you check one, I apologize. We were hoping it would do a few more. But it'll be now you really have to prioritize, really. Right? So I'm seeing housing, seeing mobility streetscape and public realm, as well as employment and vibrant downtown. Um, so those getting quite a few votes as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's a diversity and equity popping up as well. So here they come, everyone. Now, they, now they're popping up. <laughs> Local amenities and services. And again, we think we think and we've heard that all of these are important. So just getting a sense from, from those of you in this, in this space. And I, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, Having local amenity and services fit in a vibrant downtown, for example, along with, say, focus infill. So these are not meant to be mutually exclusive, and they do have a lot of overlap. Yes. But at the same time, as Susan noted, we just want to gauge your response of which one of these seem, seemingly speak most to you at this point. And if you're not on menti.com and you don't don't want you know, you're not able to do the the survey, you can certainly paste your thoughts into the chat. We welcome them there as well. So please feel free to put your thoughts into the chat if you aren't aren't able to do the menti or you're not comfortable doing that either. And then the next question is just more of an open-ended. Um, was there something that was missing or maybe you didn't think was clearly addressed or as highlighted as, as much as you would, you think it should be? And so we, or any other thoughts you have um, about those guiding principles. So we'll see if anyone wants to add anything there. Uh, 
Not seeing anything. There we go. There's a couple things coming. So looking at transit and light rail, more parks. And on the website, there is another um, a document associated with those guiding principles that actually digs in a little bit more, has some bullets underneath it, which maybe would give you a sense of um, additionally what could be included in those. But those are definitely something we want to expand on as well. So looking at um, majority Latino, so making sure that's represented there. Again, protection of agriculture, thinking about gentrification, so some concerns as well as guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Really important, really important thoughts too. And so we are, as I mentioned, these are draft. So we are continuing to look at those. A couple things in the chat about um, more seasonal events and festivals. So kind of that sense of community, mm -hmm. um, biking, being, making places easier to bike, shop, and walk. So affordability, in multimodal, looking at infrastructure, new businesses, all really great, important items that we want to make sure. And we will make sure are integrated into those guiding principles um, and reflected there as well. All right, thank you. Very so good. we'll turn it back. Climate change coming up in the chat as well. So we'll turn that back over to Jesse. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the slides then. Perfect. So this next series of slides, I'm gonna go into um, discussion on what we're calling place types. Thank you. And this may not be a term that's not very familiar with you. Um, the main takeaway here is that the, using the concept of place types helps describe not only existing, but the intended character of a community. And so it's more than just the land uses that you find on a land use diagram or map, but what the character of an area is like and how that can be uh, supported or changed or fostered in different ways. Next slide. So for some of you I know, they're very familiar with what's called the General Plans Land Use Diagram or Land Use Map. And as you can see, it essentially designates the community into different types of land uses, everything from residential to commercial open space and so forth. And this has the desired effect of sort of differentiating different kinds of activities that it can occur in that area. But, you know, and it shows you just how much can go in certain areas, but it has some limitations. So moving forward, we're looking at uh, place types. And um, let me just highlight a couple of the advantages for them. Uh, one of the things to note is that, um, you know, it, it in doing so, it not only allows for regulating the type of activities that can occur, but you can have a better sense of the size and design of buildings and how they relate to one another and public spaces too. And so it, it can help manage potential incompatibilities that sometimes may arise, um, both through land use, but also design controls, um, not just through, as I mentioned before, separation of those land uses, uh, but it also helps give residents more options for how they conduct their lives, you know, whether they drive, how they conduct their errands, visiting friends and family, uh, and not necessarily force them to have to drive everywhere they want to go. So it's a way to provide more options and choices when it comes to organizing a city for people in conducting their daily lives. Thanks, Some of the, um, some of the areas are distinctly um, residential, and some are more um, commercial or industrial character, and some allow for more of a mixture of uses. So as shown in these images here, um, these represents a commercial corridor, but also allows for not only, uh, say, storefronts on the ground floor, but residences or perhaps office above, giving, again, the opportunity for those that live in this area or nearby to maybe go to a cafe or some sort of services that are within close walking or biking. So they, while they may drive, they also have the opportunity to not have to if they so choose. Next slide. Key thing around the whole play, placemaking framework is that it's really a way to help organize and support people in their daily lives and conducting all range of activities, whether it's shopping or working, going to places to play or education, learning or just and third place for gathering. And it's not that it makes every location the same, 
as illustrated in these two images, some might be more urban or like in a downtown environment. Others are perhaps more of a neighborhood and residential um, type of place. And so this is these um, the purpose of this is to help calibrate what we want to see happen in different locations of the city. This is also helps inform um, the growth scenarios that I'll be talking about a little bit. Um, as we think you know, over long term, over the next 20 to 30 years, some of the key things that we'll be wanting to highlight is, as we talked about before, housing. As Watsonville's population grows, how do we meet their needs and uh, needs of the future, as well as the requirements of state law, uh, providing a wider range or a broader range of uh, things to do, local shopping, dining, entertainment, rec recreational opportunities. In previous meetings I've had with, for example, the Teen Action Council and youth groups, uh, they've highlighted the fact that they feel that there's not a lot of things to do in Watsonville and what can be done to help brought in those things, as well as how we can draw in visitors and tourists into town to provide more opportunities for to recreate and um, bring in tourism dollars. Uh, in terms of employment, there's a, you know industrial sector of Watsonville, but there's also been views on how we might further broaden or support the existing businesses and further expand new types of job opportunities, as well as looking at the importance of our open spaces in terms of protecting our wetlands and other um, open spaces in and around town and how they connect and help foster a nice vibrant um, streetscape and how those can play inter interconnectedly as well. Next slide. Um, so the key concepts that we'll be exploring is not only what new growth areas we might consider, the types of uses that can go into them and other parts of the community that benefit what's needed today and in the future. What are the forms or the patterns and forms of that development you know are they tall are they big are they small um, and how that helps foster reinvestment into the community that we can help foster or plan for do they meet the needs of today as well as the future and are we missing anything are there other factors that we should be considering as well so so far we have a series of growth scenarios um, that uh, we've organized just to help get people thinking about what's the future as well as reflecting past efforts. So new growth area around Buena Vista beyond the airport, looking at other growth areas uh, around Atkinson and an area called Area C, which is a little bit north of Wagner and uh, west of East Lake towards uh, County Land and Coilitas Creek. Um, looking at those, while those areas are predominantly intended for accommodating more housing, there's also need for employment and tourism and how to create a better gateway into the community. And so looking along Highway 1 and how, helping to take advantage of that area. And lastly, but not least, looking at the, the closure of the airport and closure of the crossroad money, which would involve maintaining an airport, but also unlocking redevelopment potential. And I'm going to go further into these concepts a little bit later on. In terms of different place types, I, I had a, uh, noted that they're not necessarily all the same. And so downtown isn't necessarily the same as the airport or main corridors or some of our activity centers along those corridors and neighborhoods in between. And so the main takeaway here is that we're not treating Watsonville the same, but also allowing us to calibrate what can go on in these different areas as well as new growth areas, please. So let's start with some areas that are predominantly residential neighborhood, you know, our neighborhoods. Um, looking at some images, some of you I'm sure will recognize where these uh, photographs were taken of multifamily development, both um, existing old and new, and as well as the type of housing types that might be able to fit into our existing neighborhoods um, moving forward. So. Uh, and these can be a range of different things that could potentially come in. Um, types of housing that um, do exist today, everything from single family housing to different kinds of multifamily housing, such as duplexes to quadplexes, um, 
as well as introductions to different types that perhaps are not as prevalent, but could easily fit in nice to the character of existing neighborhoods, such as caution courts or courtyard housing. And as I'll note, there, there's been an uptick in what we call accessory dwelling units or ADUs uh, throughout Watsonville. Um, next slide. So this next series of slides shows just a hypothetical example of some existing neighborhood as it is today and how that might change with some more infill, some more additional housing that doesn't involve major changes to the neighborhood. So as shown here with the yellow outlines is areas on say a typical residential lot that has some room in the backyard for an accessory dwelling unit or ADU. Uh, it fits, it doesn't change the character, it fits in, and as I mentioned before, we're seeing um, an uptick in that, particularly since the change in uh, state law. So this is one form of change that fits in. But there's other things that we might consider too. Um, in addition to ADUs, uh, there's a term that's called missing middle housing. It's a form of multifamily housing, so a duplex, triplex, fourplex, these are examples of this kinds of housing type get, that could also fit in without really providing more housing options and more choices and still fitting into the overall character of the existing neighborhood uh, as shown in this picture. So just to give you some ideas of the kinds of things that could be considered as infill into our existing residential neighborhood as well for their maintaining their character. Uh, other types of places that we want to explore are those that are predominantly more non-residential or commercial that are nodes of activity within Watsonville. And so those are what we call our activity centers. And they usually center around shopping centers along our commercial corridors. Examples of existing ones today are like East Lake Shopping Village and, and Kmart. And the reason that we're showing the Kmart here is not only have we heard a lot on social media elsewhere about what can be done with that building, but highlighting that, that that building and surrounding area represents a fairly large area. And so we wanna talk about what change could occur um, on some of these areas that are not being used or underused and, and or vacant that might be the subject of change over the next 10, 20, and 30 years and how we might create policies to shape what that looks like. And certainly for these areas, we're not suggesting that all the buildings that are there would suddenly change or go away but that within some of the under some of the some of the blanker spots new new buildings and new businesses and new activity could be added to what's there absolutely and I, i'm going to highlight that in um, next series of slides that will illustrate that you know change isn't necessarily going to involve scraping everything and building a new but might involve some infill along the corridors but you can imagine that as that evolves and changes over time you could see buildings as shown in this these series of images of maybe two, three, or four stories, perhaps residential above with some commercial or retail below. The key thing to take away in the lower left corner is the importance of the streetscape and how that creates a, a sense of place that's inviting for people that to, to um, come to that area, whether they're shopping or doing other kind of activities in their daily life. And with that is the need for an enhanced streetscape enhancements uh, along those things. And I'm gonna get to, I wanna show you a couple other slides that illustrate what that might look like, please. So looking at freedom, just as an example, many of you know, um, drive this road and know it very well. And so this is what it looks like today. It's uh, two travel lanes in either direction, uh, central turn lane and um, no street parking. Not a lot of activity on the street that invites pedestrian activity, I should say, or it's very walkable. Traffic moves through here very quickly. And so one of the things that's important um, for um, Watsonville is the fact that you know there, it doesn't accommodate other modes of travel. And so when you think about creating more of a complete street network where you accommodate more modes of travel than just vehicles, this is showing that we have fairly wide travel lanes. That gives us some opportunities to add a bike lane by narrowing the travel lanes. You're not really changing the roadway in any way, but you're accommodating bicyclists by not having them share the road, but having a designated bike lane for that purpose. 
it's not necessarily this is not necessarily a redevelopment scenario for housing or other type of development so over time you could imagine that this roadway if we're looking to further um, highlight the redevelopment potential of that parking lot next door may, uh, maybe just in the kmart shopping center area for example might include something that looks more like this where you add bulbins for on-street parking now you shift the bike lane in to make it protected from uh, vehicle traffic, uh, looking at working with the property owners in providing um, wider sidewalks, and but also increasing the development potential along that corridor too. And the, again, again, the main one of the main takeaways here is while on one side of the street may not change, the other side could, and so we might see a piecemealing of this over time but we can put in the framework of how that could occur so that you have a cohesive built environment over time. And just let me introduce one other thought, which is that what a research that's been ongoing for a very long time has suddenly hit the national news this week, you might've heard it, that just making the lanes, the travel lanes a little bit narrow, narrower than they are, can very significantly improve safety especially for pedestrians and bicyclists. Yeah, I, I, I would like, to, that's a, you just uh, gave me an idea that, that I just wanted to further reiterate is not only do you have the um, traffic calming by narrowing the lanes, you also, with the bulb in parking and uh, street trees, you're creating barriers from the pedestrians to the traffic. It helps create a more inviting place for people on the street as well as uh, cyclists on the street it's while still accommodating vehicle traffic with the same capacity moving through it. So there's multiple benefits with this kind of scenario. Moving forward. Now, not all areas are the same, but I just wanna highlight the two carriers that we're looking at is Freedom and the East Lake Corridor. One of the things about the East Lake Corridor is there's uh, um, some vacant and underutilized land that could be the subject for infill and redevelopment uh, in the future. Again, not necessarily suggesting that it will occur, but we're two. This is some areas that we can imagine fostering some um, redevelopment that could accommodate more a mix of multifamily housing um, in forms that you see here uh, at perhaps less intensities or on smaller scale, but they can fit in more of a neighborhood type setting. Um, coming back to the, an illustration of that corridor, looking at what it looks like today. Um, the initial step could be working with Caltrans because they've had plans to, and previous identification of need for enhanced bike facilities on, along this corridor. Very wide travel lanes. It's after all a Caltrans facilities that has ample room for providing not only parking, but biking in certain segments, not all, I will say. Um, but this is one illustration of how you can accommodate both parking and biking along this corridor. But ultimately, if this were to redevelop and evolve, what could that look like? And so we have another illustration of how you can create more of a place rather than a transportation facility that's more inviting for people while they conduct their daily lives and travel through the area at the same time. Moving forward. So now we have a pause here and want to get uh, your thoughts on some of the ideas and illustrations that we share with you so far in terms of the types of infill you think are, is most needed in the areas that we just presented. Everything from walkable shops to public spaces or some of the things that resonated. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, so you just saw the, the choices there and there's also an other and we're going to um, allow you to give us some of that other as well. Um, but what of the the various types of infill, what which which do you think are most needed in the areas that we're describing? So looking at walkable shops, looking at mixed use development, um, looks like mixed use is in there twice, multifamily residential, uh, outdoor dining, restaurants, or what else? What other things are are important in the um, the type of infill that we would see along those the corridors that, that Justin just talked about? So I see in the chat um, discussing improving the entry on Main Street, um, a worry or a concern about narrowing lanes leading to traffic congestion. Um, 
So it, you can we could talk a little bit about that maybe that's a little bit later as well. Um, but definitely mixed use because it got it in there twice. So mixed use development is, is something that people are looking looking for, which offers housing and the opportunity for shops and offices along those corridors. A um, couple just on multifamily, some more on walkable shops and some on outdoor dining. And there's also an other there as well. So, and again, if you don't have um, the Menti um, or you haven't loaded it yet, it's menti.com and there's the code at the top of the screen. Um, also, you can continue to post ideas and thoughts into the chat as well. Um, all right, lots of lots of uh, lots of votes for mixed use development along these corridors. And go to the next one, Monica. And then we're talking when we think about transforming the corridors more from the the visual and the mobility side. Um, what did you find most appealing when looking at some of those images or Justin's descriptions of transformation of Lake and Martinelli and, and the Freedom Corridor? Um, so is it about the bike facilities, the visual enhancement? trees and straight streetscape, pedestrian comfort and safety, um, convenient access, slowing down traffic. So these are some of the choices that we have in here for looking at uh, the transformation of the corridor. So some of those before and afters that you, that you saw there. So the slowing down of the traffic while still maintaining the, the throughput. So we're not stopping cars from getting through. Um, access of so getting more access to retail and restaurants, the visual enhancements, those were some pretty spectacular images, right? Um, the pedestrian improvements and comfort. We've got a couple more for pedestrian, more the visual. Um, and the visual goes along with the street trees and streetscape enhance or the streetscape as well. So those are definitely tied together. So the overall visual improvements seem to be something people really appreciate about that transformation, but also just the access to having all those new restaurants and retail and the slowing of the traffic as well. And, so. and the, good, the good news is that the same strategies tend to achieve all of those things yeah. at once. It, and definitely seeing uh, trees in the chat as well. Sorry, David, I was just noticing that um, and, trees and, isn't and, getting much love on the screen, but the trees is getting love in the chat. So. <laughs> and, and, and actually more, more continuous rows of trees along streets have been demonstrated through lots of research to make it more comfortable for pedestrians and to cause people to drive a little slower because it looks like you're in yep, town exactly. instead of on a highway. Indeed. Awesome. All right. Well, Justin, we'll turn it back over to you to keep going. Thank you. Good feedback all along. All right. So this next, next we're going to move from some of our neighborhoods and neighborhood centers and talk about jobs and employment districts. And so just to highlight that the general plan in terms of land uses looks at all aspects of the community and the importance of um, areas where people find employment and can conduct uh, and can conduct business. Next slide. Uh, looking at our existing employment areas, everything from historic Martinelli's to our industrial zones near Walker Street and some of our office and industrial park areas. There's a range of things that we have today, but we also want to build on or expand moving forward. So, um, and just want to highlight that not only is it over on near uh, downtown and those areas, but there's also some important uh, light industrial um, areas around the hospital and the airport too that are important. And what that might evolve into over time, whether we can imagine some more light industrial type development, more industrial, um, in that particular area specifically and perhaps nearby and at you know, what scale could that occur. Another thing to, to take into consideration as we think about employment, but how people get around to and from work, highlighting the fact that we are um, in close proximity not only to Parho, but a future rail station that's in the works by uh, Tamsi and the County of Monterey. A uh, very short distance away over off Salinas Road uh, is shown on this where is that occur, and that will not only connect to Watsonville but to the wider region, ultimately all the way down to Salinas and then Gilroy and the Bay Area. These illustrations highlight what's uh, either existing or planned to be extended and developed um, over the next uh, decades, which is why we're looking at long range planning to take this in consideration as part of this effort. In our local context, where a passenger rail station might occur, 
uh, RTC, the Regional uh, Transportation Commission for our county is actively working on potential stations that could occur. Uh, and one of the areas that is under consideration is the historic depot along the existing rail line. And so just looking at what's there today, what available land might foster some development nearby that could take advantage or help support uh, that area is could be a subject of this plan. And one thing I just want to highlight is put, putting together pretty pictures of what you know what um, has happened in other communities. So you look at our historic depot, uh, you look at these pictures here. The main takeaway that I want to leave with you is the larger picture on the on the right is one of, uh, if you go back one, please, is showing uh, an area in South Pasadena. And one thing to highlight there is that rail station you see right there didn't exist 20 years ago. And so these sort of long range efforts can lead to these kind of developments uh, over you know, the period of five, 10, 20 years. And so this is why we're looking at how this could be accommodated in our town and what could fit in nicely to it. So in terms of what fits in, um, there's things that can done, be done to adaptively use existing buildings, whether we're talking about um, like showing this upper left, a brewery, or in the next pictures where we have some very low cost treatments that, that could involve not changing the existing character or buildings themselves, perhaps, but allowing a broader range of commercial or industrial activities that could occur in, in those areas and taking advantage of the, of the funky atmosphere at the same time. Next slide. All right. So, All right, so back to our Mentimeter. Back to the Mentimeter, go ahead, Susan. <laughs> and if I, we, I think we've had a few new people join. So if you have joined um, recently, you'll see in the chat that you can go to menti.com and there's a code that you put in there and that will pop up some survey questions. So really exciting about the opportunity for a new transit center. And we just wanna get a sense from you of what kinds of things that you would hope to see around a new mm -hmm. transit center. Um, Justin showed a couple of pictures, but there's a lot of different different features that could arise around a new transit center. So you can see the list there in color. We'll go to the next slide that will launch the, the question here. Um, so we'll see what kinds of features people might want to see. So we've got shops and restaurants, um, got parking, bike parking, bike share, public art, public spaces, jobs and employment, housing and professional services, and an other category because there's okay. certainly... Um, a lot of things that can happen, exciting things around a transit center and even just the, the area within the transit center, but even immediately surrounding that and as well. Not, so. We're not talking about any large scale uh, dislocation of business, of, of, of the historic industrial businesses, but rather, you know, some some targeted infill into some, some of the blank spot or some of the more blank, blank spots really close to the station that could add to that right. historic industrial area and not, not gentrify it. And potentially some reuse of some of the really interesting buildings that are already there um, Absolutely. around there's, Transit there's, Center too. So totally. So seeing some good um, some thoughts around the employment and the shops and restaurants, housing as well, um, public space, some bike parking as well as personal services. So then that's the kind of vibrancy that we would want to have around a transit center for it to be successful is to have that great mix of different types of uses and features around there. Um, somebody in the, the chat was talking about farmers markets around the depot um, mm -hmm. and marketings in the local farms. And it's saying that the, maybe the pool is not allowing you to choose more than one. So we're forcing choice of one, but that's, Again, just to, just to get a sense and allow you to have some interaction, please post into the chat if there's a few others that are important to you as well. Um, definitely, I see something, somebody putting that the utilizing the old depot makes a lot of sense as well, so. And murals like at Ramsey Park, showing the agricultural history, so really tying into that, that's great. Excellent ideas. All right, thank you. So let's go to the next slide. And then, then Justin mentioned employment as well. So these were both considered to be kind of employment districts or these areas that Justin was talking about. So we, we have some different types of employment um, that you might like to see around this idea of a transit center. So we have a variety of different, um, different types of employment there. So wondering, hopefully this does let you choose more than one. Um, if not, I apologize, but let's see, we've got 
research and development, agricultural technology, small manufacturing and startups. Um, local trades is an also another thing that we, or another um, employment opportunity that is pretty important as well. Looking at green technology, um, healthcare, wellness, retail, arts and design. So bringing in places for artists to do kind of more industrial arts as well as other kinds of arts. Um, a few more choices or our options around the green technology popping up. Um, definitely agricultural technology. So looking at to the, um, the choice here, still only one choice allowed. So definitely please use the chat um, to put in some of your other thoughts here on the types of jobs. So you you put in your favorite here on the, the, the screen, but would love to hear some more options into the chat as well to have a little bit more, which of these other types of employment really resonate with you. So looking and one thing I just I, I think that's sort of coming out to me is the um, the fact that you know the transit line is within close walking distance to downtown. It's only about a quarter mile away. There's all kinds of retail and service opportunities within close walking distance uh, nearby. So not necessarily needing to have that in this specific area, but maybe some very tailored um, uh, neighborhood more business services that could go into it, but not necessarily being the primary focus of the area it makes, you know, I think it's one of the takeaways that's coming up through here too. And again, this is not the only option or only time that you'll be asked some of these questions. We will be asking, as Susie mentioned, of future surveys and, and we also have an email address, lots of ways that we want you to continue to engage with the process. So um, let's, we can keep going and pass it back over to Justin. Thank you. So let's talk about some of the potential growth areas that are under consideration in the general plan based off of previous efforts. Um, as many of you who are on this um, part of this meeting know, there's been new growth areas that have been considered as far back as 20 years as part of Action Power Valley and adopted as Measure U. And we're continuing to look at some of those areas uh, as part of this effort too. So. Uh, the Buena Vista and Area C areas we talked about before. We also want to further expand on those growth areas to maybe consider some additional uh, ideas uh, as part of this effort. And that includes the gateway along Highway 1 and whether or not the city might consider closing the airport outright and what opportunities that might arise. So um, in terms of these growth areas, let's go on to the next slide. Let's first talk about Buena Vista and Area C. As outlined in these areas in yellow, uh, Buena Vista, uh, for those um, that haven't been part of this in the past, is beyond the airport in sort of the north uh, western part of the city and beyond. And Area C is beyond Atkinson Lane um, and north of Wagner and a little bit um, to the other side of East Lake as well. The areas that are considered most developable are shown here. These areas are considered that because they avoid either Plan Ag land um, primarily or um, um, areas of uh, flooding potential in Area C, for example, as well as are flatter and less hilly um, and, and undeveloped in the Buena Vista area. So those are the areas shown here. And go on to the next slide. You can imagine as a potential vision for this, a area where they offers more housing potential in particular, and a broad range of that. As shown in this illustration, we have a wide range of housing types and an interconnected street grid and pedestrian network that helps with providing easy access, not only for vehicles, but also primarily focusing on a nice environment for people to get around in a safe way. So as illustrated in this image here, you can imagine where you have uh, front yards facing uh, nice sidewalks, maybe some on street parking really, but really creating a place that has a slow uh, but connected vehicle network and allowing people feel comfortable on the on the streets with uh, streets, um, nice street trees and um, sidewalks interconnecting this neighborhood. Um, next week, next slide. Uh, another thing we can consider is how to provide uh, access for vehicles along alleyways as well. And so I illustrated here, 
these same sort of streets could have rear access alleys that could um, help provide that connection, but also you know move traffic around in a safe uh, way in something that could look something like this. Um, one of the things that's nice here is not only do you have vehicle access to the back, but you can also access to uh, ADUs as shown as some of the next illustrations. Go ahead. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, other things to highlight here is that with this um, network, uh, not only we're looking at vehicle access, but other amenities such as parkland, uh, where it's framed in, sorry, go to the next slide. A series of potential pocket parks uh, throughout a network. So we're not only considering housing, but other kinds of amenities for community gathering and recreational opportunities. Um, something along these lines could be easily a part of these, these new neighborhoods. Next slide. As I mentioned before, this is an opportunity to provide more single family homes. One of the things that we've heard a lot about is the fact that there's no vacant land for a lot of large scale development, meaning that the infill that we're likely gonna see within the city limits will largely be either multifamily or maybe some ADU construction or some miscellaneous housing, but not great opportunities for new for sale uh, um, single family homes that could still accommodate ADUs at the same time. And so this type of area could provide for a broader range of housing types. Next slide. Could be not only single family homes, perhaps maybe a little bit higher density bungalow or cottage court type development. Next slide. Or even something what we call courtyard housing that frames in on a central shared courtyard, as well as more row style homes. So townhomes that are in three or more um, units connected together with, again, framed in this illustration around that uh, shared um, uh, <clears throat> neighborhood park at the same time. And, so, and these could be these could be either ownership and or rental. Indeed. But it provides a broader range of not only housing types, but rental and ownership opportunities in one existing neighborhood. Again, as illustrated in these series of Pictures everything from small lot development, single family homes to more row style houses, bungalow courtyards, ADUs in the back or in the garages, and so forth. All these things could be part of a new neighborhood um, in one of our growth areas. Go ahead. And a nice illustration of what that could look like um, on the ground once built. Go ahead. So moving on to but of it. So there's some other areas that still have some potential, but are perhaps further constrained because of the terrain. So for example, in this area, which is very hilly, uh, it doesn't lend itself to the same kinds of intensity or densities of housing that could be provided, but still could be developed with some larger lots one that, and with maybe some interconnected more rural trail networks as part of that area as well to fit in. Uh, others really have no development potential and otherwise probably would be avoided. Uh, in particular, if you go to the next slide, looking at the area C beyond Wagner, that portion of it we just highlighted is in largely in the 100 year and 500 year floodplain. And for obvious reasons, we'd be looking to avoid any housing development in that area, but we might turn it into an amenity uh, by providing parkland that could also serve as a detention basin during large rain events to help protect the community from flooding potential. Likewise, wanting to ensure that while ag protect protecting agriculture as well as the residents nearby by maintaining a buffer of at least 200 feet, which is the city's current policy and helping to help create some appropriate separation from active com uh, commercial agricultural land and nearby residences so that they don't are uh, uh, so that you don't get too close and potentially exposed to pesticides or other things that would not only be a nuisance but potentially dangerous at the same time. Next slide. So, given some of these things that we just shared with you now, let's turn it over and get some of your thoughts and feedback. As you know, before we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So, go yeah. ahead. Sam. Yeah. So, this one we're. Um... Just trying to give, gauge how people feel about growing into the Buena Vista and the area C, um, so that, that last area that um, Justin was talking about near Wagner. And while you're 
kind of giving us some of your thoughts on this, um, whether you're, how comfortable you are with thinking about moving into these, either one of these areas. I also just want to acknowledge and thank um, a couple of the comments in the chat about um, really making sure or needing to prioritize um, farm worker housing, farm workers, and the working class. And it's in really, really important that you're pointing out that maybe the images that we're showing and some of the emphasis maybe is not highlighting that. And so I think we'll definitely want to make sure that we we're doing a better job of reinforcing that because we certainly have heard from the community how important that is and how important affordable housing and services and jobs are for the communities. And, and that that's really the baseline. And that's what we were showing, we we're intending to show on the corridors also, because the downtown plan has just been recently completed. We haven't been showing the downtown much, but right. certainly the, the anticipation is that over the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years, a great deal the majority of new housing would be in higher density formats in the downtown, potentially along the corridors as well. But because this plan has a 25, 30 year horizon, we wanted to also mention these expansion areas because it, we doubt that the community would be comfortable overall foregoing any new single family housing for decades. So the, the 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 notion really is that it would be a balance and common and and mix right. of housing with certainly the higher density multifamily options being the core, and then the question of, yeah. of where yeah, for sure and we just where it might be most appropriate to offer some options for folks to have single family detached homes if if they choose and can afford it. And, so and one thing I like, I like, go ahead. Let me just add one thing um, real quickly. Um, part of the, the challenge with the housing crisis that faces not only Watsonville, but California at large, is the lack of supply that's being built on a regular basis. And so part of the issue is helping to foster more production in general, but a wide range at the same time, so that you have smaller units and large that can accommodate needs at all income brackets. And so it is true that new housing is very expensive, but by providing it, it allows opportunities for change over existing housing stocks and people to find and potentially afford. Understanding that there's also programs that the city fosters for requiring a certain amount of new construction to be at affordable rates nice. and other things that provide everything from vouchers or other things to uh, help address the needs, particularly for our very low income residents in the community. Right. And I'm, I'm seeing um, a good chunk of people feeling pretty comfortable or very comfortable exploring, looking into these areas, um, a little bit on the, the not so comfortable side too. Um, and so that's just something that, you know, we're, these are just alternatives or options and scenarios at this point. We will keep talking about these with the community and keep moving forward and, and looking at what does that mean when we say we're comfortable um, and what are some of the what are the, the elements of that that make people feel comfortable or not comfortable is one of the next questions we want to ask. You can go to the next slide. So go right into the, the next question there. So if you were one of the folks, or even if you were, you were a supportive of um, looking at growing into these areas, what, what are some of the concerns that you might have about growing into Buena Vista or that area C by Wagner? Um, and these are, you know, they may be things that can be addressed. They may be things that can't be addressed. So Justin mentioned a few obstacles that already exist. So land use inequity was one that um, clearly is coming up in the chat as well. Looking into the chat also, um, somebody mentioning about seniors wanting to down, downsize. Um, so th that's an implication, or it has an impact as well. Um, there's some comments about trying to support um, property owners who want to relocate potentially or add features to their own properties, adding ADUs, moving into multifamily, so really providing some of the support. And we'll talk a little bit at the very end about the housing element, and there is another part of the general plan that's really focused on housing and not just the building of housing, but also housing policy and some of these things that you're, that you're talking about here also relate to that. So here we see the need for more high density housing, which wasn't really being shown in these areas. These areas were really looked at more as kind of an opportunity for um, lower density housing. Um, as Justin noted, trying to find a balance. 
Um, concerns about parking, concerns about traffic. They can, there can certainly be a mixture uh, in, sure. any of, in any of these areas. And sure. how that mixture happens is, is something we want to, yep. we're going to be thinking about a great deal. Yeah, and, and you'll note that um, some of those different kinds of housing types that we showed very quickly, I understand, from single family to more, more multi-family options have a wide range of densities associated with them too. And the other thing I'll just highlight is, you know, we're focused on some of the growth areas in part because of the planning efforts the city has already undertaken for its downtown. And so that will be incorporated as part of the general plan, which means that we've already done a large amount of planning for um, allowing for high density housing, particularly in our downtown area. Um, and we can also explore what that could look like in our growth areas and other corridors too, as part of this effort. So access to transit, lack of ownership, these are all, all good concerns and important concerns to, to think about as we look at those areas. Um, and then the next question is really looking at what is appealing to you about expanding into these areas? Um, so what are so those were some of the concerns about expanding into these two um, potential growth areas. What might be some things that are reasons to, or that you found appealing in, in some of the presentations? So starting out with not much, nothing, <laughs> that's valid. Um, for those that found this sort of, come, had some high comfort level, what are some of the good things? So potential for home, more home ownership or increasing home ownership? Other things that for those, there are more housing, more jobs potentially. Any other factors that make you kind of, for those that felt comfortable going into this area, so seeing some economic development, the opportunity for increasing parks. Um, again, more housing, just offering, offering more of that housing for housing options. everything's a mix and everything's a balancing act that's why it's so important that we hear everybody's perspective so you see more economic development again potentially jobs in these areas also see a costco pop up there um, tax revenue so bringing more more money to the city spaces just having space to grow somebody added that one so all right we'll turn it back over justin to Keep going. You know, we want to get to those breakout sessions as well. Thank you. So I'm going to try to, um, I'm be cognizant of time. I'm trying to go through these next series of slides as uh, quickly as possible, but also not in a way that you gather some of the key takeaways of each one of these. So let's move on to um, the, the next series of slides, please. We're getting there. No worries. Toggling back and forth, it must be getting stuck. I try clicking on the 90, yes. Hmm. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> must be tired. Well, let's just go to 91. There we go. Wonderful. All right. So we talked a little bit about um, uh, growth areas around Buena Vista and Atkinson Area C. Let's talk a little bit about Highway 1 as a potential new gateway. Uh, looking at the next slide, um, one of the key things to consider here is while many of you here today have a strong appreciation and connection to Watsonville, those that are traveling through the area could be remiss in not knowing that they pass by the third largest city in our region after Salinas and Santa Cruz. And so one way in which we could help with uh, providing um, a better sense of Watsonville is also create a better connection and connect um, and um, gateway into the community. Next slide. So looking at our historic downtown area where that's located in proximity to some of our major roadways, Main Street 152, across the bridge in Pajaro, as well as 129, Riverside. Looking at the land area 
uh, framed by the highway and some of these major roadways that have high visibility off of the highway itself, how to take advantage of that, while also not only fostering connection to our downtown and nearby areas, but also the beach. There's a lot of things that uh, could be taken advantage of and further fostered. Move forward. You know, looking at existing conditions, this is what largely people think of when they pass through this area, largely agricultural. Uh, there obviously, there's the historic Redmond House, which speaks to the agricultural nature of the area. Riverside um, is a state highway surrounded by ag ag agricultural land and associated um, packing and other agricultural businesses. And of course, the road to the beach um, is not too far away. But none of that really speaks to Watson. And so what might occur over time if uh, uh, the development potential was right? Everything from considering maybe some regional retail, such as Costco, I saw that was a mental mayor just previously to provide uh, more employment and other uh, shopping opportunities, as well as uh, maybe a regional uh, uh, sports facility, such as shown in the upper right for different kinds of sporting soccer, baseball and so forth, highlighting the agricultural nature of the area, maybe with some sort of showcase market, maybe some demonstration fields, uh, and how that could fit in nicely with some of the adaptive reuse of nearby warehouse space uh, in the industrial zone, as well as more visitor serving and tourist type development with additional hotels along the highway for people traveling to and through the area, maybe some more recreational opportunities to um, entertainment venues that could also fit into this environment. So these are a range of things that might help create more of a gateway and also an invitation to people to come to Watsonville at the same time. Next slide. Um, another key takeaway here is, go ahead, is not only looking at the gateway, but to the highway, but also across the river into Pajaro. I mentioned before that there is a new transit station that's in concept and well, it's being planned out by TAMSI, so how that be, can be better connected to, but also looking at the river and how it's currently more of a back of house scenario. Let's go to the next slide. And how we can help accentuate the existing amenity that it is along some of our existing trails that run along it and um, along the river and to some of the saloon environment and really face the river and create it more of an inviting place for people to take advantage of and enjoy at the same time. Next slide. The airport has come up a lot, um, both in our outreach and in some of our stakeholder interviews with people, um, uh, surveys, as well as uh, hearing from members of not only the community, but our council and their questions and concerns about the airport in terms of maintaining it and what potential growth potential it has uh, around and on the airport. So one of the one of the potential growth areas that's under consideration is the potential closure and redevelopment of the airport itself. Next slide. And were that to occur, understanding that there are development constraints um, with any brownfield site, um, could provide a range of opportunities from employment to um, housing, maybe um, R and D and park space, and even retail. So. The site itself is close to 300 acres. You can imagine that there's quite a lot of redevelopment potential that could occur on airport property itself. Next slide. But the main takeaway here is as we think about Watsonville and what kind of place it is today, what we wanna preserve, how we might wanna grow and evolve over time. And that's really the, the main focus of what this general planning effort is about. And we, but this is one way which we're trying to get a sense from the wider community on what are the key priorities that we should be focusing on. Go ahead. I think we have a question coming up here. So we want to ask a similar question that we asked about growing into the other two areas, so the Buena Vista and the Area C and asking a similar question about growing into the gateway, these gateway areas, oops, and the airport area. So we'll get there. And somehow they're not there. So we're going to ask you to paste it into the chat. We've been please, a little, please. have some snafus with our Mentimeter this evening. So maybe post some of your thoughts into the chat about why or why you 
what you do like or don't like about the idea of growing into these gateway um, areas that are some of which are not necessarily within the city boundary and the idea of going into the airport. And we are going to do some breakout sessions in just a little, a few minutes um, to let you actually talk to one another about some of these and explore it a little bit deeper. Um, but maybe if you want to paste some of your observations into the chat, that would be great. So I see um, somebody asking about the blue zones. I think Matt's, Matt Orbach is answering that one. Um, I see a focus on jobs and housing. Um, asking about Measure U as well. So let's see. What do you, what are the, your thoughts about growing into these different areas? Positives, negatives, neutrals? All right, I think we, I think we might want people to start talking, Justin, maybe we, there we go, there's some stuff coming in. Um, the airport space should be should, is a resource for access and delivering services. Um, airport provides a lot of economic output. Um, love the idea of the our agricultural showcase in the Redmond House area. Um, a thorough analysis of the airport space should be completed. And I think some of that is happening with the airport um, planning efforts that are going on. Um, Opposed to a complete closure of the airport. Other thoughts around the, the gateway areas as well. Looks like we might have our Mentimeter question back. Um, is it that we'll just maybe ask that comfort level question again, just give you a chance to respond similarly to what the last question was about the other two growth areas. Um, definitely seeing a little more folk a little more agreement on May. Well, there we go. Change it a little bit, but more on the strongly agree side. If you are just joining us, um, I think we had a couple people maybe join since the last question. You can go to www.menti.com, as you see in the top of the screen there with the code, and that'll allow you to respond to the question online as well. Um, airport space could be better used for housing and park space, I see. Someone else saying the gateways are important. A town is stronger based on how inviting they are. Kind of sometimes that can that can tie together. Um, looking at in interesting possibility for the crosswind runway, protect the airport and the ag lands. But the, yes, that historic Redmond House looks like somebody else thinks it's a great gateway. Um, so there's really interesting opportunities, and this is a a great time for the city to be able to reflect on these and then for the community to have discussions around them. I'm um, seeing some some more comfort about moving into these areas, potentially a little bit more um, opportunity there. You see a lot of the extremely comfortable. So the next question, I think we'll just launch right into that, Monica, and then we'll, um, if there are concerns, I think some of those have been expressed in the, the chat, but if you have any other um, concerns that you'd like to type up here on the screen, we'd love to hear those as well. Um, and this, this is the perfect, the, the general plan update is the perfect forum to talk about all of these different potential yes. opportunities because people can think about each area in the context of and in comparison with all the other possibilities. So and you're, it's not, really just, a, a, you're yeah, not just looking at one subject. You're saying, well, how you know, compared to this area, what you know, what about this area? And it's really a great opportunity to think long term. So of course. Um, really thinking yeah. about long term in the future um, or longer term, right? And really visioning what can what could be, what could be. So not a lot of other concerns. I think a lot of those were expressed in the chat already. So maybe Monica just go to the next one and then so looking at speeds, traffic speeds. Very good. Oh, there we go. There's a few popping up. So we must still support the residents, creating a, a, a opportunity for more maybe walkable. Um, we don't want to lose the economic engine of the airport. So there's definitely, and that's still been, that continues to be a conversation among community members. And just about... one really important thing to think about is that if you plan, if, if you're focused almost entirely on making Watsonville as beautiful as possible for the residents, the vibrant downtown, the corridors, the parks, the pl gathering places, it just automatically becomes more attractive to visitors and tourists. So that it becomes, that'd be, Comes sort of an add-on. If you just make it the way you want it to live in, 
a lot of people are going to find it and come spend their money there to help you support your town more more robustly. So some concerns looks like about habitat, um, concerns about the, yeah, maybe the green space as well. So maybe, Monica, if you want to go on to the next one, which is some of the, the positives about expanding into these areas. And, um, so creating identity, more jobs, potentially the, the welcoming entrance. And I think that was expressed in the, the chat as well. Um, more opportunities and lots of opportunities for different kinds of opportunities that the, the growth in these areas um, definitely can help to foster. I see a, another comment in the chat about um, the airport being an asset for FedEx and Amazon expansion potentially. So um, partial, partial closure, closure of the crosswind one runway. Um, this is another comment in the chat. So looking at that as a possibility or positive. Um, so tourism, jobs, again, that I, I did, vision of identity. All right, so in the interest of time, I will turn it back over to, to Justin um, to walk through the, the growth scenarios again that were presented at the beginning, and then we want to make some space for some um, breakout room dialogue. Thank you. So this leads to our discussion of potential future growth scenarios. So no surprise, the five ones that we talked about here, everything from the Buena Vista, Area C, Gateway, closure of the airport, and also closure of the crosswind, as uh, indicated in the Metro Meter and some of the comments today. So moving forward, first and foremost, let me just highlight the um, infill only scenario. So what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities here? So one of the things to highlight is that it's within the existing city limits. Um, we're seeing that in the near term that we can likely accommodate a lot of the housing need that's being planned for the next housing element cycle. For, so for those that are intimately involved in these planning efforts, we're also not only updating the general plan, but the housing element as well. Uh, the city is required by the state over the next year, eight years to plan for accommodating 2,000 plus housing units within its jurisdictions. And we can find that um, particularly in downtown and with ADU construction and some infill housing that we're seeing in the near term, we can likely accommodate it over that time frame. But over the longer term, that may be limited. After all, there's very few vacant land available. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to redevelop underutilized uh, parcels, um, even if there's an economic potential there, the property owners and developers may not choose to do so. And it also limits the type of housing that could occur to largely higher density rental type housing products. Next slide, next click. And of course, as we noted before, the airport does constrain what can occur in some areas, including along the Freedom Corridor, as outlined, uh, shown on this image, uh, that represents airport safety zones one through five, the most restrictive, which means that the Kmart building and surrounding Freedom Corridor would not be allowed to redevelop as was previously shown on some of the earlier conceptual slides. Next slide, please. So let's look at Buena Vista. It's part of uh, Measure U, which extends Measure Q, uh, that was first envisioned as part of Action Power Valley over 20 years ago as a potential growth area to provide a lot more housing. Uh, it's an area that uh, is not considered to be prime ag land pr predominantly. Uh, it's within um, the urban limit line that was de defined. Uh, and as we illustrated with some of those earlier slides, it can accommodate a wider range of housing type, not only higher densities, but also single family and other for sale type products. It does have some steep slopes and uh, it also is constrained by airport safety zones one through five in um, limiting um, residential development specifically in those, area, in those specific safety zones. Next slide. So let's look at other growth areas that we talked about before, such as beyond Atkinson in area C, beyond the Wagner in Eastlake area. Um, it's flatter than Buena Vista. Uh, it's easier to extend utilities into this area. It's not subject to airport safety zone restrictions. Um, it's uh, located adjacent to the city. As I mentioned, it can extend utilities and it connect to existing roadways fairly easy. It also provides a broader range of housing types. However, this is an area that is prime agland. There are very farms and other types of um, uh, 
uh, very valuable agricultural products that are grown in this area. Uh, it's not uh, within the urban limit line. It would require a referendum to change measure, uh, the limits imposed by Measure Q. Um, and of course, a large portion of which is in the floodplain that uh, should be avoided so as not to put residents in harm's way. And as hopefully as we articulated earlier, could be addressed through the potential provision of say um, parkland that could also serve as floodwater detention in the case of flooding events. Next slide. The gateway, again, th these scenarios are um, mainly to highlight the differences between these and ultimately there might be a blending of some of these, but just to again to reiterate that this area is largely flat, flat and has high visibility along highway one also not subject to the airport restrictions and can provide a broad range of different kinds of economic opportunities, as well as maybe recreational, such as a soccer stadium, hotels, and other things that could fit nicely in that area. It too, however, is in very um, productive agricultural land. Um, a, while a small portion is within the urban limit line, much of it is not, and likewise would require a referendum. And of course, there's large areas that are within the floodplain as well. Next slide. Closure of the airport is, uh, we've talked about already, um, as the, one of the key advantages here is there's no referendum needed uh, to amend the city limits because it's already within the city limits. And by closing it, it would unlock development potential not only in Buena Vista, but along Freedom. They would no longer be constrained. And there has um, development potential on a large area of land of over close to 300 acres. Um, the challenges or disadvantage, of course, would be that there would no longer be an airport that could provide any services in this area, at least from this airport. You'd have to look at Marina or Monterey or other airports for that purpose. And there is the fact that there is not only endangered species, but hazardous materials that would need to be properly addressed to allow for redevelopment to occur. And so one scenario that could be explored further would be simply the closure of the classroom in one way. It would allow for the maintenance of the airport as is today. Um, it would likely be consistent with FAA obligations to maintain a viable airport. And by that, I should note that for those that attended the council a few weeks ago, uh, in which the airport master plan was presented, one thing that was highlighted as part of that is FAA, the federal government, no longer supports the maintenance of the crosswind runway, which means that the city would not be eligible for any federal funding to, for any maintenance activity. And it would be required for the city to be able to uh, financially support that in the future. And so it's a question of whether the city chooses to do so. And if not, if and if the, uh, and as shown by the studies um, through that effort and with the FAA's direction, it's not really needed. And therefore, uh, one of the considerations is to just close the, the crosswind but maintain the main runway as you see here. Next slide. So to recap, these are some of the five key uh, growth scenarios that are under consideration, largely to highlight the pros and cons or issues and challenges with each of them that can inform what the um, community and city would like to um, prioritize moving forward over the next 20 to 30 years. Thanks. So finally, <laughs> we've left a little bit of time for a breakout session. I uh, would like to uh, invite people to take part in, um, in a small group discussion, allowing each attendee to be able to talk about their thoughts of what they've heard tonight, and then give an opportunity for afterwards to report back to the wider group. Um, before we close for tonight. And um, Susan, please. Yes, so um, we're gonna move each person into a breakout session. Each room will have a city staff member and a planning team member as well. Um, and this is an opportunity to ask questions, to provide your thoughts, to have some dialogue with, your, um, with fellow community members. Um, if you would like to have the conversation in Spanish, um, you can either raise your hand or note in the chat or when you get put into the room, you have the option to go back to the main room. And if you would like to have the conversation in Spanish, Carlos will be back in that main room and can facilitate the conversation there. Um, so we don't have any specific questions to, to post to you, no exercises. It's really just more free, open dialogue. Um, so we'll allow you to ask questions and provide some, some more dialogue, dialogic comments instead of just written. 
Um, so we're going to automatically send you into a room. We're hoping that maybe you'll be willing to spend about 10 more minutes than um, what we had we had scheduled. So if we're going to go to about 810, just so we can come back and, and hear what we heard in the other rooms and give you a sense of what to expect next. Um, so we're going to break into those rooms right now and we'll work for about 15 minutes. So we'll open the rooms and enjoy the conversation. All right, well, welcome back, everyone. I think we have everyone back. We lost a few a few folks in the transition there, but I hope I think there was some good dialogue happening. I dropped into the the various rooms. So I thought maybe we'll take a just a quick minute for each of the facilitators just to share a little bit of what um conversations were like in your room. And then Justin, I know you have some um some final slides just on some next steps and what to expect going forward. So perhaps we'll start with Susie. I know you had a, a small but mighty group there. You want to unmute and just share a little bit of some of the highlights of the conversation? <laughs> oh, Zoom, are we the there we go. You unmute. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we talked about um, growth potential near the gateway, um, the popularity of soccer in this region, and how having a um, uh, a stadium like that. Um, near Highway 1 would be a great addition to the community, uh, that Watsonville is a diamond in the rough, um, concerns with complete closure of the airport, given that during emergencies and other uh, types of events where Watsonville might be closed off from, um, from the rest of the world, that that is an important uh, amenity and um, also discussed um, traffic currently on our major corridors and the length of time it takes to get from home to work, um, making sure that that housing and jobs are are placed in the right um, in the right location so that's that traffic is reduced. And then, um, is there anything I'm forgetting, guys? Awesome, thank you. Um, so how about Matt, share a little bit about what happened in your breakout session? Yeah, we had a, a good a good dialogue going. Um, so I think the main focus was, you know, lots of the plan has lots of opportunities for more housing and jobs. Um, it sounds like a plan that can actually be implemented, which people liked. Um, focused on, you know, the emphasis on the train depot as an asset. Uh, the fact that we're really cognizant of the desire to build wealth within our community, as opposed to necessarily having money flow to outsiders or corporations. Um, uh, focusing on the gateways and attracting visitors was a really important point. Uh, and the fact that we're just thinking and talking about how to grow in the right way and, and, and um, exerting control over how our future growth, which is gonna happen either way, how that happens. Uh, some of the negatives or things that people wanted to avoid were uh, you know, avoiding housing development in the floodplains, um, you know, sprawl, uh, there was a desire to correct some outdated zoning that restricts expansion of non-conforming residential uses in, in industrial parcels, um, and maybe a potential to do that sooner than the end of the general plan process. Um, and also, um, that people felt that there maybe should be a little bit more focus on low-income residents, not just within the city of Watsonville, but also in our associated community of Pajaro. So, and then airport conflicting opinions, because there's always airport conflicting opinions. <laughs> um. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, and I'll go turn over to Justin. Then, Justin, when you're ready after your report out, um, we can jump right into some of the closing slides. So, thank you. Uh, similar things, but slight different nuances that I want to highlight here. Uh, everything from some particular property owners in town that are interested in possible redesignating or rezoning their property to allow more infill potential with ADUs or additional units. So, that's one thing we will definitely be addressing. Uh, in terms of the agricultural character areas, many people want to make sure that we're embracing the agricultural setting and like the idea of providing uh, some sort of showcase or demonstration uh, near the Redmond House in the Gateway area. Also in the Gateway area, there was interest in you know, more tourism and helping to invite uh, people into town. On the topic of the airport, there was a range of opinions from being surprised that the possible closure was being considered to concerns around what that might entail with um, uh, understanding that there's environmental cleanup involved um, to while some places 
feeling very comfortable with its closures, others wanting to at least maintain the main runway um, for some of the reasons that has already been articulated. Um, questions about traffic or concerns around traffic were raised, particularly on Main Street and not feeling safe driving downtown uh, and being able to access shops or otherwise. Um, looking at the Freedom Corridor, not liking some of the existing um, um, uh, businesses along that, particularly fast food restaurants and wondering uh, what could be done differently and how that doesn't bring good jobs uh, to the areas. So there was a wide range of things that uh, came up during our conversation that speaks to it. And also, um, I, just, I just want to highlight also the uh, acknowledgement of um, the notion of Watsonville as a primary Latino community of working class with a strong sense of place and how that needs to be you know, highlighted as part of this effort too. So those are some of the key things that I think were um, that came out of our uh, very uh, com uh, robust conversation that I thought I'd just raise uh, part of the group. Terrific. All right, thank you very much. And um, Monica, if you wanna pull the slides back up, we'll have those last few for Justin to close us out and just wanna appreciate everyone's input. And this is just the beginning of the conversations we plan to be having with the community <clears throat> about these options and these scenarios. And we look forward to your continued engagement. So Justin. Sorry, it's muted me somehow. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to highlight a couple of things that we've mentioned this before. I just want to reiterate that this is one of many ways in which we're trying to reach out, conduct re outreach. And so we're going to be doing more pop up events. Some of you actually uh, saw us at the farmer's market. We hope to do more of that, weather permitting, as well as other locations too around town. Uh, in the first round of engagement, we did everything from visit food distribution lines to uh, beer mule. So we're trying to read a broad segment of the community in places where they are um, as part of this outreach effort. So I look out for more opportunities for you and others to uh, provide your input on as part of this effort. And uh, we highlighted or you noted very briefly that as part of this time frame, we're also updating what's called the housing element. While this is a specific chapter of the general plan, it has to be adopted by itself every eight years. This is per state law. Uh, we we're working on a draft that we hope to have available in the very near future. So for those that have been, have, um, are interested in housing in particular, that should be going out live uh, in the not too distant future for ultimately to be brought forward council likely in the new year, possibly in January. So please uh, look out for that as well. And again, feel free to email myself and Matt, who's on this call too, and Carlos, who's helping um, spearhead that effort and lead that as well. All right. So I just want to take a moment to thank you. You stuck with us until 8.08 in the evening time. This is really impressive to stick out for a two-hour meeting. We covered a lot of territory, got a lot of good thoughts uh, from all of you. I really want to appreciate and thank you for uh, your thoughtfulness. Uh, constructive comments that you provided. This is going to help us as we further develop um, different um, scenarios for how watching the continues to evolve and change moving forward. And these slides will be made available on the project website, city website as well. There'll be notes from the meeting that have been posted, as well as the recording um, should be available for those who weren't able to make it. So you can encourage um, friends and neighbors and other family members to, to get engaged and take part as well. So thanks, everyone. And, and I, I don't want to make everything about the airport. One thing I should note is that council did direct staff to investigate the shortening and closing of the crossroad one way that will be likely going back to a public hearing, um, perhaps in the February or a March timeframe in the new year. So there will be more specifics on that topic in the not too distant future. Great. Good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.